All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is being translated into Spanish live, so be sure to choose your language at the bottom of the screen. We're ready to start our webinar now. My name is Miguel Barrios, and I'm a technical services manager for poultry with EW Nutrition. Today is my great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Matthew Jones. Matthew is a veterinarian and nutritionist at Southern Poultry Research Group. He attended the University of Georgia, where he received a bachelor's, DVM, and PhD. Then Matthew worked in research and technical services for Azomite. He's now been at SPRG for a couple of years, now working alongside Dr. Charles Hoffaker, where they conduct research on different challenge models in poultry. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Miguel. Matthew Jones is uh, joined today by our panelist, Ajay. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Ajay Boyer. I am Global Technical Manager for Poultry uh, in EW Nutrition. Um, looking forward for a very exciting and interesting presentation by uh, Dr. Matthew. Uh, you, I welcome you all. Thank you. And together we'll help answer questions during and after the presentation. Questions can be asked throughout the webinar and the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Some will receive instant replies from us and some will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow Matthew's presentation. Now let's get into it. Matthew, do you have the floor? Awesome, thank you, Miguel. And thank you EW Nutrition for, for having me and letting me uh, present today. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, today, we're gonna talk about managing enteric health in APF systems, um, particularly in regards to necrotic enteritis. And uh, I'm just gonna kind of talk a little bit more on, on my background. Uh, Miguel was pretty thorough, but uh, like he said, I went to University of Georgia for my bachelor's, transitioned into a graduate program um, and started a veterinary degree in the middle. So I came back after completing my veterinary degree to um, be a full-time graduate student and focused on intestinal health and applied nutrition. From graduate school, I transitioned into a job at Azomite Mineral Products where I had the pleasure of working um, as a researcher and a, a technical service representative um, and one of the really great experiences that I got from that was um, the products, a lot of the products have a fee manufacturing component. And so as you can see in this image here, um, I got to see a lot of test facilities and, and learn a lot about fee manufacture. And that kind of, kind of primed me to come into this role at Southern Poultry Research Group, where I do, um, like Miguel said, applied health-based poultry research. Um, and I get to do both, um, kind of use both parts of my education. I get to be a nutritionist as well as uh, a veterinarian. And so, as you can see in that image, I might in the morning do a, uh, a lesion scoring and then transition into uh, formulation for an upcoming experiment. So it really is a, is a great place to keep both sets of skills sharp. A little bit more about Southern Poultry Research Group. Um, you can kind of see the, the satellite image here. It's, it's separated into three houses and we have that, that yellow bar represents where our feed mill um, was just, just came in. Uh, it wasn't in the satellite photo yet, so it's fairly new. Um, but uh, we do primarily broiler research, although we do turkey experiments, um, laying hen experiments and, and heavy breeder experiments on a regular basis. Um, and if you were to kind of categorize our research into, into maybe buckets, um, you, we have enteric health type studies, food safety type studies, uh, applied performance and maybe digestibility and so on. Enteric health makes up the majority of the studies that we do at, at SPRG. And so why is it maybe one of the largest buckets of research uh, and why are we talking about it today? And it's because necrotic enteritis and the factors that predis predispose um, to the condition are leading factors for economic loss in the poultry industry. So while clinical disease um, listed down there is, is um, 
really important and gets a lot of attention, the loss um, from for a large part is due to body weight gain loss and feed efficiency or loss of feed efficiency due to more subclinical type necrotic enteritis. And with a condition that causes this much pathology, um, there's definitely going to be a, a welfare component. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse here, um, but there's definitely going to be a welfare component. Um, and we want to try to minimize suffering as much as possible. Another reason that um, we're talking about enteric health today is because it's a very widespread issue and it affects a lot of growers. So again, clinical mortality uh, gets a lot of attention. This image on the right um, is, is fairly typical, pathognomonic almost for necrotic enteritis. You can see this really dark enterotoxemic liver, which is characteristic. And then this Turkish towel appearance is, is the necrosis of the villi and the jejunum. Um, and it's, it's fairly striking and it gets a lot of attention, but this image on the left would be more, more mild lesion associated with subclinical necrotic enteritis. And so I don't have a normal image, um, but in a, in a normal situation, that healthy muscle layer is going to cause that, um, when you uh, make that first incision, is going to cause that um, jejunum to fold in on itself and kind of overlap. You can see that this piece of intestine has, has little to no tone. And then um, there will also be some kind of linear organization in a normal intestine. Um, and in this case, there's no organization and you can kind of tell there's mucus proliferation. Um, and so this would be kind of the driving force in that economic loss. So just so we're all on the same page as far as the pathogenesis of necrotic enteritis. Um, I kind of broke it down broadly, but there's going to be some means of enteric disruption usually, and that disruption is going to cause the bird to respond immuno immunologically, and part of that response is going to be mucus production. That mucus is going to give the Clostridium perfringens a platform to proliferate on and eventually start producing toxins especially if it's a toxigenic strain of clostridium perfringens, And that the toxin production is eventually going to start killing the cells in the mucosa and cause that necrosis of the mucosal epithelium and will have um, more permeability in that intestine and the toxin is going to get into the bloodstream and create that enterotoxemia that we were just looking at in the liver. And as you could imagine, this mucosal epithelium disruption is going to kind of feed back on itself up here into this intestinal barrier disruption. And so there is some cyclicality um, to the disease process. So it's not, um, it's not as catchy a title, definitely, but this is maybe a more descriptive definition of the rest of my discussion. So I'm going to talk about a review of necrotic enteritis challenge models to provide insight into managing enteric health in AVF systems. And the reason that I, I kind of took that approach is uh, I was looking at previous discussions regarding necrotic enteritis and the, the major factors that we manipulate in research in order to increase the severity of the disease are going to be the same components, um, core components that you want to adjust in the field in order to decrease the impacts of necrotic enteritis. And so I kind of took that approach and I'll, I'll tie it back throughout the discussion. So we'll talk more about the necrotic enteritis challenge models that we, that we use and how they apply. But broadly um, in, in models as well as in the field, there's going to be two core components that I think of. And that is some means of intestinal disruption. And then the second component is gonna be exposure to a toxigenic strain of Clostridium perfringens. So I have this equation down here at the bottom. Um, this came from Dr. Collett uh, at, when he was at the PDRC. And uh, it's also published in the diseases of poultry in the first chapter or two. But uh, 
it just breaks down the risk of infection based on primary uh, factors, including dose, challenge frequency, pathogenicity, and host resistance. And so just as an example, if we want to decrease the risk of infection, we want to decrease the challenge dose, decrease the challenge frequency, try to decrease the pathogenicity of the agent, or, and um, increase the host resistance. And broadly, from a scientific standpoint and a research standpoint, to create the disease, we're going to do the opposite. Um, but we're going to come back to that, that equation and how it applies to each of these factors um, in, later in the discussion. So as far as the first component, what causes intestinal disruption in, in poultry? Um, there's several things. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, but Imeria species are a really big one. Um, it is the one that we use in most of our models. Um, and feed ingredients have been used in many models to create intestinal disturbances. Um, and then heat stress has been, has been shown to increase permeability of the intestine. Um, and the same with disturbances caused by viruses and mycotoxins. I'm gonna focus on the first two, Imeria species and feed ingredients, because they're more commonly used in models. But from an applied perspective, we definitely wanna keep these other stressors in mind uh, in regards to dis disturbances in the intestine, because um, if timed right, they, they could induce uh, clinical and subclinical uh, conditions as well. So we're gonna start with the dietary component of intestinal disruption. So in necrotic enteritis models, um, people, some researchers use fish meal, some use crude protein manipulation. Um, these might, in some cases, are, are kind of tied together. There's models that use calcium manipulation to help recreate the disease and uh, diets that utilize non-starch polysaccharide, these NSPAs, NSP sorry, containing ingredients. NSP containing ingredients, um, primarily I'm thinking of cereal grains like wheat, rye, and barley having higher inclusions of, of non-starch polysaccharide. So just it for no, in no particular order, um, some examples of these um, research models, uh, calcium manipulation, Dr. McElroy, uh, necrotic enteritis induced by barley and wheat, which would be those NSP containing products. And then this is a, a model where they were trying to manipulate the crude protein in order to recreate necrotic enteritis. And, and all of these models have been reported to be successful in, in different conditions, and everyone's model is a little bit different. Um, but uh, one interesting takeaway from the, especially the ingredient manipulation models, several of them are theorized, or in this case reported in this um, NSP containing ingredient um, article, that the the ingredients cause proliferation of Clostridium perprendens. So that's something to keep in mind as far as the pathogenesis of these models. So um, in addition to ingredient manipulations causing intestinal distress, um, more broadly, formulation change can cause some lesser stresses, but stresses nonetheless. And so, um, changing the formulation is not typically thought of as, as being a, a stressor. Um, but Dr. Ricky at uh, previously in Arkansas, I think he's at University of Wisconsin now, um, reported feeding an ingredient and then changing the ingredients that he was feeding abruptly. And it caused immediately complete transformation of the microbiology in the intestine. And while this isn't as severe or stark a circumstance, you could imagine that something similar is probably happening when we change phases, because there are gonna be different nutrient inclusions and that microbiome is gonna to adjust to the nutrients that are available. Um, and so also with transition from starter to grower, a lot of the time in the United States, especially, we're also gonna transition from a crumble feed into a pelleted form. And so that 
again, it, it doesn't seem like a large stress, but there is some acclimation that occurs in, for the bird. And so um, if we compound those kind of minor stressors on top of a uh, coxie cycling uh, incident or a vaccine even, the stresses can compound on one another and, and potentially create issues and increase the likelihood of necrotic enteritis. And that's, um, it makes sense from a, um, a veterinary standpoint because we know that stress reduces resistance uh, of the host. And so as we increase the um, stress, we're gonna reduce the resistance and increase the overall risk of infection. So just to put this uh, to a to more of a visual format. Um, this is Coxy vaccine cycling. And so you can see the oasis shed increases up out to 18 days, and then it kind of drops off dramatically. And so just in that time range there, that time range between 14 and 21 days, these birds are going to go through um, a peak Coxy vaccine cycling. And this will be kind of a, a stressful period. And a lot of times I have this feed change at 14 days because in research, we, we use these even weak values, but in the real world, a, a certain quantity is gonna be fed based on the number of birds and uh, they'll feed it until they run out. So they'll, they'll probably run out somewhere, somewhere in here. And if we time it such that we run out at the peak of that um, vaccine cycling, again, we can recreate some of those stressful events that we're, we really wanna try to avoid. So Imeria species uh, are the, the model that we predominantly use in order to elicit that initial intestinal disruption. And specifically in controlled environments, we will give Imeria maxima at 5,000 sporulated oocysts uh, per challenge bird. And you might ask why, why Imeria? You just listed several different ways to induce that intestinal disruption. And uh, the reason that we use it is because it's it's very practical, especially in the United States, because many of the ingredients that we just spoke about, um, besides maybe calcium, are not used at high inclusions or at all in, in diets in the United States. And typically, if we do use a diet containing um, uh, like a NSP containing ingredient, we would typically use an NSPase in order to try to mitigate that as a stressor. Um, another reason is Imeria species are, are going to be something that all broiler houses, most all broiler houses are exposed to in the United States. And so these will be stressors that, that are very applied to the industry. And for us, they recreate very consistent models. We can um, usually you challenge with Imeria and, and Clostridium in order to recreate the necrotic enteritis. So why Maxima, why not, you know, we know there's several different types of Imeria species. Well, not all Imeria are created equally in terms of recreation of necrotic enteritis. You can see this paper from Nichols et al. Um, there's, in this case, um, five different Imeria species evaluated, uh, both alone and with Clostridium perfringens. And if you look in the column labeled necrotic enteritis, you can see that most of the Imeria species can recreate necrotic enteritis mortality to some extent um, when Clostridium perfringens is introduced. Uh, and so you can see Acervulina, Maxima, Nicatrix, and Brunetti all recreated clinical necrotic enteritis. But um, in this experiment and in the second experiment in this paper, Maxima kind of rose to the top in regards to um, clinical necrotic enteritis um, and in our circumstances, this is this picture on the left is excreta from this is from a coccidiosis challenge but it could be from a necrotic enteritis um, model as well. And so when we see this mucoid fibrinous um, excreta six days after we give Maxima, we know that the, the 
coccyx is cycling well. And usually we want to confirm this. Uh, if we have mortality, typically maxima is not going to cause mortality. This is a very severe case. Um, but we could confirm this with lesions in the intestine um, as well as, as OPGs or scrapings. So similarly in the field, if, if one saw this kind of sloughing and confirmed that it was maxima through gross lesions, um, OPGs, and uh, scrapings, you're going to want to try to minimize uh, exposure to clostridium perfringens as much as much as possible in order to reduce the likelihood of getting the disease. So one more component that I wanted to talk to you in regards to how we give Imeria species is, is when we give it. Um, we're going to give it in two ways. The first way is we're going to give, we're going to keep the birds naive, usually in battery cages, and then challenge them around 14 days with a really large dose of Imeria maxima at that, that 5,000 sporulated oocysts level. The other way that we're going to introduce maxima is through the vaccine. And so we're going to wait till that second or third cycle when the cycling is closer to its peak and then challenge with clostridium perfringens. Um, but the, the timing is you need to really, to recreate the disease, you want to try to minimize the host resistance and the birds are gonna to start to become resistant to that vaccine fairly quickly. Um, and so just to put this to maybe again, a more visual um, chart, this is the same graph with the coccidiosis vaccine cycling. And again, you see it peaking here at around 18 days and then falling off. So those birds have become resistant and resistant, more resistant and are shedding less Imeria. And so if we timed it um, after that peak, we're gonna get much less, if any, uh, necrotic enteritis. So we really wanna time it before that resistance sets in um, prior to, in this case, prior to 18 days. So as far as kind of this analogy that, that I'm carrying out, in order to control um, coccidiosis, in our models, what we're looking at is the product we're using, some kind of intervention, and the benchmarks we're evaluating. And so those that would be used, um, these would be the same products that would be used in the field, would include, um, if we are not doing uh, ABF, ionophores could be included, and antibiotic free in the United States cannot include ionophores because of the antibacterial properties. Uh, but it includes vaccination programs, uh, chemicals, and alternative products. So kind of going back to that equation a little bit, vaccination programs um, are going to, they're going to kind of shift the peak. It's going to be earlier. We're going to do a controlled exposure and then we're really highlighting uh, resistance. We're trying to increase host resistance with vaccination programs. Chemicals, we're trying to reduce the challenge dose. We're not allowing those um, Imeria to reproduce like they want to. And alternative products, it really just depends on the alternative product. Um, there's theories behind the mechanism of action um, and kind of that fall into both of those categories as far as increasing host resistance and decreasing the uh, challenge dose of Imeria. So I just want to recap um, an overview of intestinal disruption. So feed ingredients can cause intestinal disruption. In order to mitigate this, we're going to give quality ingredients. If we do use products that may cause intestinal disruption, we're going to use enzymes to try to help that. Um, and we're going to try to keep Imeria cycling in mind um, when we change the phase of feed in order to reduce the, as much stress as we can. Um, Imeria control is really important. Um, keeping an eye on maxima cycling in the house is really important and intervention um, responding to that early intervention um, is best. Reducing the peak is really important and I, I oversimplified um, 
the control strategies. But, you know, vaccines, I have a little bit more listed here. Vaccines would include the type of vaccine that you're using, how you're storing it, administration practices, um, and brooder management uh, in order to get that vaccine to cycle like you, like you want it to. Um, but all of these are going to really be reducing the peak down the road, uh, both vaccines and chemicals and alternatives like we just discussed. So while those predispositions are, are important and, and definitely important in the models we use, the, the second and definitely the most important factor component of necrotic enteritis is a toxigenic strain of Clostridium perfringens because without the toxin, you do not get this enterotoxemic liver, this really dark mahogany liver here, and you don't get this necrosis of the, of the villi and the mucosa of the jejunum. So let's talk a little bit more about Clostridium perfringens. Broadly, it's a, it's a soil organism that is highly resistant in the environment. It is normal flora in poultry species, and many of these Clostridium um, have the ability to produce um, metabolites that are toxic to poultry. So I want to talk a little bit more about normal flora. We could introduce it as, as a pie chart, kind of look at a moment in time and look at different sections of the intestine and kind of see that Clostridium perfringens is there in a, normal, um, in a normal broiler. But I thought it might be interesting and, and helpful to kind of show what Clostridium perfringens populations do over time in a, in a challenge model and kind of compare a non-challenge group to a challenge group. And so that's, that's part of what I did here. And so just to introduce this study, um, I had two groups, a challenge group and an unchallenged group. And I had six replicates of 10 male uh, Ross chicks for each replicate. I used Imeria Maxima at that 5,000 sporulated oocysts in 14 days and then waited six days until that cycling was at its peak and gave Clostridium perfringens um, at day 20. And you can kind of come back and, and look at all the ways that I'm um, using this equation in order to increase the risk of infection in this case, if you want to. So just to set the stage um, on this chart, again, I don't know if my, my mouse is coming through at all, but these light gray bars are the unchallenged group. The dark gray bars are the challenge group. And we have different times here, 14 days, which is the day we gave Imeria, 20 days just prior to giving Clostridium perfringens, and then 21, 22, and 23. And what we're looking at here is direct Clostridium perfringens enumeration in the excreta. And so we're looking at the Clostridium perfringens population in the excreta. And these these values here on the left, the zero through seven, those are log transformed uh, most probable number. So this five is actually 10 to the five colony forming units per gram. Um, and so we can see here before we gave anything, this, this 14 day uh, sample was taken prior to giving Imeria that the, there's, there's a, really high background of Clostridium perfringens. Um, this point was actually the highest point the unchallenged group was in terms of Clostridium perfringens enumeration. And then it kind of drops off down to day 20. So um, just from a interpretation standpoint, it doesn't seem like Imeria had an impact on proliferation of Clostridium perfringens. And then we gave this Clostridium perfringens right around the time of this arrow and we can see that those groups do separate a little bit more after that time. But what separates this, this normal commensal population from this uh, other population that we introduced? And that is its predilection to um, produce toxins. Specifically, alpha and net B are, are perhaps the best characterized of the toxins but uh, TPEL is becoming more and more popular as well. And so if we take that same graph that we were just looking at and kind of overlay those toxins on it, 
uh, it actually comes out looking like this. And so what, what we're looking at is the green, both the solid green and the dotted green bars are alpha toxin expression. And the solid black and dotted black bar represent net B expression. And so you can see before we gave anything, there is some background expression of, of alpha toxin in this, in this commensal population. And then after we gave Imeria, you can see there, there's some separation in alpha toxin expression between the, the unchallenged group and the challenged group. So that may indicate that um, Imeria is, is kind of supporting this, this toxin expression for, for whatever reason. Um, and then after we give clostridium perfringens, you really see this stark separation between net B in the challenge group versus net B in the unchallenged group. Um, and so this, ex this exposure is really what's, what's driving that mortality. And so speaking of mortality, we saw no necrotic enteritis mortality in the unchallenged group. But just to kind of give some perspective on, on what it would look like if we overlay the mortality in the challenge group, it would look something like this. Um, and you can see we give clustered in perfringens here between day 20 and 21. And 24 to 48 hours afterwards, we have this really large spike in necrotic enteritis mortality, and then it abruptly uh, comes back down. And so, um, yeah, that, that introduction of the net B in combination with the Imeria cycling is, is really important for introducing that um, necrotic enteritis. So at this point, you might be saying, well, great, we can re reproduce it, but where is it coming from? And that is, it's, it's in the soil and it, it uh, creates these very resistant spores. And so it's unfortunately, usually in the environment, um, it's in the litter, it's in the soil. In the United States, we typically use dirt floors. And so it will stay persistent in the dirt. Um, I mentioned water here, I listed water here. More specifically, it's gonna be able to grow in the biofilm of the water line. Um, and then anything that can really translocate organic matter is gonna be at risk of transporting uh, spores from one place to the next. And it is a problem. Um, it's a problem in the industry as well, um, where these houses just become reinfected with necrotic enteritis because both Imeria species and uh, Clostridium perfringens are fairly environmentally stable. And so they'll just break and then break again because those pathogens are still in the environment. Um, so we utilize this in one of our models. We, we will challenge with Imeria and clostridium perfringens, and then use that litter from that challenge model to challenge the next group of, of chickens. And so we're really just capitalizing on that environmental persistence in order to recreate the disease. But if we don't want to recreate the disease, or if we don't want it to spread from one model to the next, we really need to take um, strong precautions uh, related to the environment. So we want to disinfect the water lines uh, and, and treat the litter or even remove the litter in our case. Um, and then we use very strict biosecurity policies so we don't spread it around the farm. Um, because again, these are very, very persistent organisms that will spread if you're not careful on, on substrates, organic, especially organic material. Um, and so this, this is, picture on the left would be kind of that model where this reused litter uh, marked as treatment three is, uh, has been exposed to Imeria maxima and there is clostridium perfringens present. Whereas this pen on the right is fresh pine shavings and we are gonna, we have given them a uh, coccidiosis vaccine in this case and we're gonna give them clostridium perfringens at 14 days right around the peak of, of their cycling. And so just kind of a, a thought question, um, which of these would you expect to have higher clinical necrotic enteritis mortality? And if you're thinking um, treatment one, you are correct. 
models where we use fresh litter tend to have much higher clinical necrotic enteritis mortality than models that uh, we use the supply of litter challenge. Although we do see clinical necrotic enteritis in, in both models. Um, and this has been described by Dr. Hoffaker and Dr. John Smith at Fieldale. When they looked at, at some retrospective studies, uh, they noticed that, that fresh shavings was actually a risk factor for necrotic enteritis in a lot of incidences. Um, and there's a couple of theories about that, and we can talk more about that uh, in just a minute. So what are we going to do in order to reduce uh, the risk of getting Clostridium perfringens? Like we mentioned previously, in order to keep it from spreading and keep it um, at lower levels, we really want to pay attention to the environment, to husbandry, and that involves uh, litter, litter treatment, water line de uh, disinfection, uh, and and definitely want to pay close attention to biosecurity um, as far as, as, far as uh, you know, boots, sanitation. And you're definitely also going to want to pay attention to ingredients. Um, like we mentioned previously, the, some of the ingredient inclusions are thought to increase proliferation of Clostridium perfringens, so we want to try to reduce that as much as possible. Um, alternative products and competitive exclusion type products, both are going to kind of shift that microbiota uh, into a more uh, healthy balance um, by displacing or changing the, the microbiota. Um, and we want to minimize disturbances as much as possible that are going to create mucus. And that could be any stressor, whether it's imuria or, or a feed change of any kind. So, um, necrotic enteritis control. Um, I'm going to try to just go through this, uh, start with maybe Imeria and then we'll go to Clostridium perfringens. So we're going to try to control the challenge dose and the challenge frequency by using vaccine programs and by using um, chemicals and alternative products. Uh, we're also going to use biosecurity uh, in order to reduce uh, introduction of these pathogens. Over time, the vaccines will kind of populate the house and in theory give more, um, less pathogenic strains. And so we can maybe over time influence this pathogenicity of the agent. And then again, vaccines are really increasing the host resistance. Um, you're, it's kind of a, a controlled exposure. So they're being introduced and, and getting resistant um, so that there's no spikes down the road in cycling. Um, from a Clostridium perfringens standpoint, uh, challenge and dose is a lot of it is going to be environmental control. So again, back to that litter and disinfecting the water lines are going to be really important over time. Um, and biosecurity is going to help this whole uh, top line as far as the challenge dose uh, frequency and introducing pathogens. So one more thing that I just wanted to introduce um, is, is a clinical perspective. And this comes from, from Dr. Hoffaker. This is, if I don't know if y'all have ever listened to his discussions on necrotic enteritis, but he usually includes this um, with, with many of them. And I think it kind of ties back well into what we've already discussed. So necrotic enteritis, he has um, seen to be more severe in the winter time. And that might be because in the winter, there's gonna be a shift of programs typically um, as far as controlling coccidiosis. And the other thing that's gonna happen in the winter is especially in the South, we're all going to close our houses up. Um, so there'll be less ventilation and we'll also have um, different uh, humidity in the house, different litter moisture. And so it likely has to do with how the coccidiosis is cycling in the house as far as that severity that is, that's been observed in the winter. He often sees farms uh, with poor husbandry which kind of ties back to that applied litter model we talked about. There's, there's just going to be Imeria and Clostridium perfringens 
in the environment because uh, they are very persistent. And if we don't um, treat the, the environment in terms of litter, water, and, and keep from introducing it from a biosecurity standpoint, uh, we're gonna have reoccurring issues from uh, necrotic enteritis. Something else that he's noticed is that typically there's a spike around 16 to 18 days, um, especially when you're using a coxidiosis vaccine. And that kind of ties back to that, that image that I've shown several times now, where we have this increase in oasis production out to about 18 or 20 days, and then it starts to fall off as they become resistant. Um, that 16 to 18 days is gonna be that peak uh, asexual replication when the birds are most vulnerable to um, to clostridium perfringens. And so that makes sense in terms of how that vaccine is cycling. And so it's really important to know how the vac how your vaccine is cycling and how it what it's going to do in, in your specific circumstances. It is a widespread issue. Um, he sees it in as many as 50% of the houses that are placed. Um, and like we talked about with the clean litter, typically, um, or it might be a risk factor as far as introduction of new litter. Um, and they see it in 37% of cases. And it's not very well characterized, but there's probably a couple components to this uh, increased incidence in fresh litter. Um, you know, the moisture is gonna be a little bit different and it, they're gonna have differences in capability of retaining moisture. And so the coxie is going to cycle a little bit different in new litter than it would in reused litter. And the other big difference is even though we give um, the pathogens in that applied litter model, there's also likely good organisms in there too. And so there might be some benefit to that transpawnation that occurs even um, if there are pathogens present in that reused litter. These are just theories, um, need follow up there definitely to, to be able to substantiate that. So um, I just wanna draw some, some major conclusions that we've already highlighted today. Um, we're gonna wanna manage for those predisposing factors that are gonna be the first component of the disease, which I kind of think of as uh, enteric disruptors. And that could include coccidiosis control, through uh, management uh, as far as vaccines, chemicals, and alternative products. And we're gonna wanna make sure we source quality ingredients and address them properly. So if we're gonna use uh, NSP containing ingredients, maybe using an NSPase, uh, which is an enzyme to help degrade that non-starch polysaccharide uh, in order to help decrease the stress to the birds. Uh, the second component we want to try to minimize exposure and replication of toxigenic strains of clostridium perfringens, and that includes that environmental sanitation that we've already talked about a couple of times, um, and that's water lines and uh, with a strong focus really on the biofilm um, because the the bacteria will will cling to that even if we kind of flush the lines. Um, litter management and whether that's treatment or or um, otherwise. Uh, and, and biosecurity, I don't have it on this list, but biosecurity is also really important to, as far as introduction of this disease. Ingredients are gonna be important for, for clostridium perfringens as well, because we don't wanna create that overgrowth that we've already talked about and using enzymes as we need them. Um, and also alternatives in order to modulate that uh, intestine and kind of manage for, for healthier intestines. And again, I don't, I don't have it on here, but, but maintaining the health of the bird is, is just vital um, because kind of tying back to the stress, um, the, the less stress the bird is, the more resistant that bird is going to be and the more capable they're going to be in, of fighting off that infection. And so doing everything we can in order to establish and maintain a healthy gut is, is really gonna be critical in order to reduce the, the likelihood and the risk of necrotic enteritis in the field. So with that, um, I'm gonna 
answer questions and uh, I hope you all learned something and enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Now we'll move on to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Some questions will be answered in that box and some questions will pick up and will be answered live. So Matthew, um, though I am a panelist, I have a, a quick question for you, if you are ready. Sure. Absolutely. So you said uh, the clean or new litter is a risk for necrotic enteritis. So is it with all the different kind of litters used worldwide or um, maybe uh, the wood shavings you showed in the picture that is more problematic? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question as far as, because uh, I know elsewhere, it, it was definitely a very U.S. perspective um, because elsewhere they're going to change the litter um, between every flock. And so, yeah. yeah. So I think that that, that has to do um, with how the vaccine is cycling in our, in our circumstances. And I'd say it'd be interesting to kind of compare how the vaccine cycles uh, in those circumstances, uh, in kind of those different bedding circumstances. So maybe rice holes versus um, um, pine shavings in our case, uh, because you know, we know that there's some antimicrobial uh, components, especially to pine shavings um, that you might, that might kind of change the flora in uh, between bedding. So that's a really good point. And it, and it would be more applicable to, to our, the US conditions. Yeah, because I, I thought uh, we need a clarity on this because uh, in many parts of the world, they go prefer the new fresh litter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, sometimes the old litter creates the uh, reused litter creates the problem. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to have a clip because that should not be a blanket message that, oh, new fresh litter is bad. Yeah, yeah no, no, it, it definitely comes down to management and understanding, understanding how your vaccine is going to cycle in the conditions that, that you have um, is, is super important. And, and also just um, maybe attention to, uh, to that microbiota, um, I think is really important in that early phase, especially on new litter. Thank on you. That same, on that same train of thought, uh, Matthew, one of the first questions that we have is what component in that built up litter you believe helps with potential necrotic enteritis challenges, according to some of the data that you showed? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't put a name on like a specific component, but I kind of think of it as, uh, as far as like a competitive exclusion type introduction so yeah again we're, we're introducing pathogens and we are recreating necrotic enteritis so it is not not good um but but you know compared to these other challenge models uh, the birds do do relatively well and i i do think there's just some beneficial component to it's probably like a transplantation that happens because and the way I'm thinking about it is, uh, in, in maybe in nature, uh, there's going to be exposure to, to the mother, to other things that are, to feces that are going to kind of see that gut early on. Um, and when we put them on that fresh shavings, we're kind of taking that out of the equation. They don't have as much exposure to those early bacteria. But uh, what might be happening is, is something similar, where in this applied uh, litter model, we use reuse litter. Uh, there might be some beneficial seeding that occurs early on. And again, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific bacteria in mind. It's more of a, I think of it as a broad, like competitive exclusion type event. Right. So the, uh, another question we have, uh, Dr. Matthew is probably from South Africa. 
And the question is, uh, what is your view on the efficacy of probiotics in any control versus the antibiotic growth promoters? Yeah, so probiotics, um, there's definitely a place for probiotics in a program. And I think, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say, I really don't like to compare um, like probiotics and prebiotics and other alternative type products to, to antibiotics because they're, they're really not. They're really two different classes. Um, and so I, I try to think of the alternatives differently than, than use of antibiotics, but there's definitely a place for alternatives. They do help, but I think that really what we need to focus on is, is kind of how we're going to use them and, and what we're going to use them in combination with. Um, just kind of, kind of to, to previous discussion, I'm derailing the conversation a little bit, but um, like, a, like a probiotic might be more useful, especially in those, in those settings where we have fresh or reused litter, um, because that's kind of doing part of that, uh, that seeding that we were just talking about. Again, it's not, it's not quite as, as broad because these are more well-characterized specific bacteria, but, uh, but it would be doing something similar in, in, depending on the probiotic. Gotcha. Uh, Matthew, question that came on the Spanish side is, do you have any experience or data on previous work with coccidiosis vaccine and ABF layers? Oh, that's free range question. layers. <laughs> free, free range layers. Um, I don't have any data on, on uh, layers yet. Um, but I think it would be very interesting and I'm looking forward to, to doing more work. I've done some um, coccidiosis work in layers uh, and, and they definitely experience the different Imeria um, species differently than broilers do. But, um, but I haven't, I haven't uh, had the opportunity to, to use different vaccines in layers yet. I'd really like to. I mean, one question that I think we can, uh, we can talk about forever and it will look differently across the world, really, especially as we have these type of conversations is how do you evaluate a healthy intestinal flora, what it looks like, what does that mean? You know, and of course, that's going to look different in Georgia, Alabama, South Africa, but do you have any, you know, top pointers that you usually look at? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I actually posed a similar, when I was in graduate school, I posed a similar question to a, to a microbiologist, a more molecular microbiologist. And, um, and she, she pointed me back to the research. And, uh, and if you go back to the research, it'll, it'll point you in a lot of different directions. And, and that was her point. Um, there's, there's still a lot that we need to learn as far as, as what the healthy microbiota looks like. And I think that there's, there's a lot of work being done right now um, that maybe it's not about so much the, the bacteria that are present because all of these bacteria are producing metabolites um, and interacting with one another. And some of these bacteria are producing the same metabolite. So, you know, does it matter if you have this one versus this one or is, you know, is it okay if it's like this or like this? Um, and, and that's something that, that's being um, kind of explored right now. And I think there's a lot of good work being done there. Um, but that's just to say there's, there's a lot of work that needs to, still needs to be done um, on, the, on the microbiota side and the healthy microbiota side. Um, because that was kind of my point as far as the, the microflora. And um, sometimes, sometimes people are surprised, you know, that we might introduce Clostridium perfringens, you know, at, at such a high level, but it is already usually in the intestine at a, at a fairly high level. Um, even before we challenge. Yeah. Shane, so next, go ahead, Ajay. Yeah. Um, the next question is uh, related to the feed change from starter to grower. So the question is uh, based on the coxie cycling, what day do you recommend uh, the feed change from starter to grower? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And it's, it's going to depend on the program and, and the economics kind of in, in that specific situation. But, but uh, well, kind of the takeaway is 
I would look at how your vaccine is cycling. Um, take, take some field samples, look at OPGs and kind of get a good feel for when your vaccine is cycling and where the peak is. And then once you identify that peak, know that the, the asexual, the more stressful time is gonna be just prior to that, 24, 40 hours prior to that peak in OBG. Um, and so once you identify that, try to, try to transition them either you know, before or after. So a couple days prior to that peak stress or a couple days, a couple three days after that peak stress. Um, you, just, you just don't wanna fall right in the middle if you can help it. And, that, and there's times that you just can't help it. Um, but, uh, but if at all, I think it is, it's a good idea just to be cognizant of, um, that potential stressor. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, we are due to end the webinar very soon. So we'll still stick around for a few minutes and give participants a chance to have their questions answered. We're about five minutes out. Another question that came in, Matthew, is about the use of organic acids and water pH. Of course, we can talk about water as a completely new subject, but uh, have you seen any research as far as uh, decreasing the water pH and the effects on necrotic or clostridium? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of specific examples that have been been published. There's there's definitely work being done in that in that realm, and we we do use um, disinfectants. Uh, I, I, I referred to it in the in the discussion. Um, we we disinfect our water with uh, with a combination of products after after a necrotic and rice challenge in order to decrease that that biofilm in the lines. Um, and we'll we'll actually use different products serially in order to to reduce the the biofilm. Um, but as far as specific cases and specific articles, none come to mind, but I'll, I'll, uh, I, I know I have one in my, in my file folder. I'll, I'll bring it out if, if you reach out to me. Gotcha. All right. We have another question by Dr. Khan, and this is in layer breeders. And coxie vaccinated flocks with roller specific vaccine always facing necrotic enteritis from ages 12 to 22. And the same thing happens in non vaccinated commercial layer flock treated with a coccidia stat. They're all on the floor, not in cages. So, what may be happening there? I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to uh, think about this kind of scenario. So, so they're getting necrotic enteritis at 12 to 22 weeks on vaccine. Okay. Um, and so I would, I would, in this case, take, take a look at the vaccine, make sure the vaccine was cycled properly. Um, and, uh, and because the other thing that's going to happen, if, if this commercial layer flock, I, I imagine it's on the floor and not in cages. Um, right. But uh, coccidia stats, what will happen is there is some leakage that occurs. Um, and so part of that is they, they, um, they have some leakage and they can develop the resistance. But what can happen is it'll stay low for a long time and they aren't able to kind of develop that resistance. And then, and then there'll be a seeding event where they have like exposure and the, the imeria will spike um, and those birds don't have as much resistance. Um, so I, that, that could be what's happening, um, especially if it's happening really late like that and at around uh, 20 weeks. What about uh, uh, other Imeria species, uh, Matthew? Do you think there may be other seeded species in that litter, you know, since they're on the floor that maybe the vaccine is not really helping with? There's a chance. It depends on the vaccine. Uh, you know, some some will kind of focus on uh, A. Cervulina, Tinella, and Maxima, and some are a little bit broader. Uh, but but yeah, there's definitely a chance that that vaccine is not covering the the species that are present in the environment. Yeah, Matthew, um, one interesting question, and probably it's not related to ABF. So suppose if you you can use uh, antibiotics and ionophores freely. 
what is your view on like combining probiotic and coxi vaccination versus uh, the use of historic ionophores slash chemicals and the AGP route, provided that you can use antibiotics. Yeah, if I mean, so so we have AGPs, vaccines, and probiotics, and um, and like traditional ionophore. Those are kind of the three the three options there. Um, I mean, so I'm not going to answer this directly, but the the people have figured out how to make each of these work very well and to grow very large, healthy birds. Um, and it really just depends on how you want to niche, niche down. Um, because like I said, you can really make any of these programs work. I will, I will say though, um, you know, antibiotic growth promoters used alone, um, they, they definitely help, but even the use of antibiotics sometimes, especially when we get really large challenges with coxie, um, can can be overwhelmed by the response. And so, um, it it uh, it's definitely maybe a standard, but uh, it's not impervious um, to disease. Yeah, nowadays, uh, you know, in many circumstances, what happens is that uh, you see the resistance to the traditional ionophores or chemicals, as well as very indiscriminate use of uh, the AGPs. So maybe the question is like, um, you want to give a break to the um, your, your traditional way and uh, use the vaccines and probiotics and maybe phyto, phytogenic options in between. So that might be um, a good, good, uh, good solution means you can use antibiotics, you can use ionophores, but using it judiciously, giving them break so that uh, you the, the resistance is decreased and you continue to use that. Uh, I think that that can happen, right? Oh yeah, abs you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, especially with chemicals, we know that they have a very short window um, of, of efficacy before resistance will start developing. Um, and so definitely cognizant use of those products. And, and like you mentioned, rotation, I think, is, is really, really important um, to, to establish a very uh, a healthy program. Miguel, how are we doing on time? Yeah, uh, Jay, I have time for one more question. So uh, Matthew, if you could please. Uh, one of the things that we hear a lot in the industry here in the U.S. is Necrotic enteritis, farms breaking with necrotic enteritis on a recurring basis. Do you have any go-to uh, interventions that uh, you've seen some consistent response to? Any recommendations that we could pass on to growers? I mean, I would say probably the first thing you would want to address is, is the water lines, because I feel like they get probably less attention. Um, and so I would address water lines uh, and, and environmental in, uh, influences in general, litter, um, and uh, and definitely you're going to want to, you know, go back and look at your program. Look at if you're using a vaccine, um, how it's cycling in that in that facility, um, and then kind of what alternatives you're using and and how those play into that as well um, are are all really important for reducing the likelihood of that being a problem in the future. Great. Thank you. So we still have a couple uh, questions that were unanswered in the Q&A box. We apologize for not being able to deal with all of them during this session, but we'll be more than happy to pick up our conversations via email. If you write to webinar at ewnutrition.com, all questions will, will be routed to us. Also, this webinar will be made available on our website tomorrow. You can also join us in our next sessions, which you can find online. Thank you for attending and for your questions. Stay safe and bye for now. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Thank you, Miguel. Thank and you. Thanks to, Thank you, thanks guys. to all the audience.